destiny generation. You gotta go out. Know your faith. You gotta know it to share it. You have to let everyone know. Let me tell you about it. Share the faith. Don't you please. know that my faith is important to me? It's our destiny. We are the destiny generation. All right, how's everybody doing? All right. Let's begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord God, thank you so much again for this place. I thank you for these families and all my friends here and for all the healing that's happening this week and all the happiness and all the friendship and just all that good stuff that we don't get enough of and we get it here. So I'm just pouring over with so much gratitude and appreciation for everyone and for everything here. And I pray that we all hear from you tonight Whatever we need to hear from you, that we would put aside all earthly cares, that we would calm our minds and our hearts, look up to our Heavenly Father to receive from you what we all need tonight. Holy Spirit, come. Don't let me get in the way of what you have to say to your people tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so you're hearing all this stuff this week, but I bet if, if I just said, okay, so what is the cause of all the unhappiness in the world? Yeah, it, it's, it's, like, it's like a trigger response now, right? It, it, it's like Pavlov's dog, you know, you hear the, hear the bell, and it's like, oh, food, it starts salivating, like, oh, the cause of all that, that's sin. It's like, you know, I, we hear all the language, but it doesn't mean we get it. You know, language is a beautiful thing. I did, I, I went to grad school, so I understand that you have, you know, the nuances of language are important. I, I get that. It can also be dangerous because basic, basic stuff can get lost in fancy language. And this is where it's great to yet again let the little child lead us. I've got to introduce you to another family word, the icy cold well, well, well. My gift to you so that you can keep spreading this madness, this one from my niece, Megan. I received my first icy cold one day when Megan approaches me with the following proposition. Uncle, I found an olive that even you would like. Now, you got to know something about me and olives to understand the seriousness of this claim that she found an olive I would like. That's impossible. I, I, there's foods I don't like, you know, not many, but yeah, there's foods I don't like. No, olives are different. They offend me. I'm personally offended. I don't understand. If somebody says, you know, I kind of like the smell of gasoline, it's weird. It's like, I get that. I, I get that, it's weird, but I, I get it, I kind of, I, I understand. If somebody says, ooh, I love passing roadkill in the car because you smell that, you get hungry. I'm going to think that person's lost it and needs help. That's how olives make me feel. I don't understand. They're disgusting. They taste disgusting. It's I, like, what is wrong with me that everybody loves these things? How could that possibly taste good? Maybe I had a rotten one as a kid and it, it like made an imprint. But I don't, I, they look like tadpoles from hell. They, they, they get these disgusting things, and then they, they find these little, like, offensive red wigglies that they, like, pimento peppers, I guess they could. All I know is it's an offensive red wiggly that they stuff inside the tadpole. What? I could go out and find some demon spawn, and I could put it in a glass jar and pickle it in some tasty brine and slap a sticker on the front of it and charge you $10. None of this makes it good for you to put it in your mouth. I, I, I mean, I really don't understand. And so my niece, again, I found an olive that even you would like. I did, you know, no way. It's like, you tell me I have to try new things. And if I take a fair taste, of, my own words coming back to me, right? Every time, like when she's sitting there being a finicky eater when, as a baby. If I give it a fair taste and I still don't like it, I don't have to eat it. But there's the fair taste rules. Not a little nibble and spit it out. No, an honest bite, an honest taste. No holding the nose, no quick spit, no quick swallow. No fair try. Only then if I still don't like it, I don't have to eat it. I was like, ah, she got me. So already I'm ready for the gag reflex. 
because it, this is like, I, I don't know what's going to happen. And she hands me the tadpole, and it's got something white in it instead of an offensive red wiggly. I don't know what I'm looking at. And, and I'm like, okay, I've got to take a fair taste. So I bite half of this thing off. Whoa. Whoa, that's, that's good. What is I eat the rest of it. That's delicious. doesn't taste like an olive. If it tasted like an olive, I would hate it. It tastes like th th just something delicious. It was, it was fantastic. I'm like, kid, this is great. You were right. And she goes, she slaps her hands together. Oh, it's going to be good. I don't know it is good. Give me some more of these. She goes, no, not the olives. Your icy cold well, well, well. She goes, I'm going to go get it. She's going to get something. She leaves. She goes into the kitchen. I finish the all. I look at my brother. I'm like, what's an icy cold well, well, well? He's like, well, it, it's like, it's, it's like a, you know, well, well, well. Look who is right after all. It, it's like an I told you so. Oh, okay. It's weird. Why is she going to get it? You could just say it. Oh, no. They've taken it to a whole new level. Like, what's about to happen to me? She's going to administer your icy cold well, well. Well, why is it icy cold? Well, have you ever had somebody say, told you so? You might say, oh, it's just got cold in here. It's cold in that way. It's a cold thing to say. It's cruel. It's mean. You know, it, it's, it's not nice. I was like, well, what's about to happen to me? Now, I hear the freezer open. I'm getting scared. And it's open for a minute. Like, she keeps it open. I'm like, what's she getting out of the freezer? You're well, well, well. Like, this is not making sense. Freezer closes, and in comes my niece, Megan, burdened, burdened under the weight of this. And she comes and carrying nothing, but she's carrying it. Oh, oh, it's just so much. I told you so. I can hardly hold it all. It's going to break my arms. She comes running up. Well, well, well. Look who is right about those olives after all. Snap. I swear I could feel it. It was like she sort of like a bucket of ice water all over me. What did this? This is brilliant. I see it like from, from a, uh, an academic point of view, what this kid just pulled off. She just gave ontological being to an I told you so. She, it now has metaphysical substance. In other words, it occupies time and space. It can collect temperature. She made it so you could throw it at your neighbor. This is fantastic. Now, the thing with the icy colds is what goes around comes around. I watched her get hers, and it was awesome. We get, it's like the first warm day when the snow melts and you can actually go outside and play and you're just itching to. So it's time to go outside and play with my niece and nephew and she can't wait to go out barefoot, right? So she goes outside barefoot and Aiden, you know, looks at his little sister, my nephew, says, uh, Megan, you need to go get on socks and shoes. Yeah, but I miss, I miss the way the mud feels squishing between my piggies. I know, but you hate the ants, and the bugs are going to be out, and you're going to freak. We're going to have to stop the game, and I just don't want to go through all that. I'm just looking out for you. Go put on some socks and shoes. Okay, that's a good big brother. Good job. She's like, oh, thanks, Aiden, but I'll be all right. Okay. So we go outside, and we're playing freeze tag, and, and Megan's standing there frozen, but no one tagged her, and that's not how it goes. Like, that, the game just breaks apart at that point. It just doesn't work if, there, if you don't, like, not want to be frozen and that's a chase. It just, just everything was meltdown, freeze tag meltdown. Like, Megan, you're supposed to run away from me. It's just the game's broken. She's like, okay, look, I'm freaking out. I'm frozen in fear because I see ants. And I, and I need to go put on socks and shoes, but I know what that means. She's like, what, what do you mean you know what it means? I just go take care of what you're going to go put on socks and shoes. She's like, all right. Begrudgingly goes into the house, and I look over, and my nephew Aiden is frothing like a salivating dog. <gasps> oh, yeah. It's going to be good. It's going to be icy cold. I mean, he's losing his mind. I said, where is it? Is it inside in the freezer? No. Outside in the cold winter shed? No. Uncle, it's right here in my and it's particularly freezing. And he pulls out nothing. He's like, I gotta get this out of my hand. I'm gonna get frostbite. He goes over and he puts it on the bench. The nothing, okay? He's not holding anything, but he puts it on the bench. 
He says, don't tell her where it is. She'll sit right in it. And I'm looking, like, I could feel the bad juju coming off this place. It was just this emanating with badness. It was cold. I was like, what have they done here? It's real. And out comes Megan. All right, where'd you put it? And he goes, well, I do not know what you are talking about. Let's just continue the game of freeze tags, uh, Megan. Aiden, I know you, and I know it's waiting for me somewhere. You just, let's just get this over with. Where'd you hide it? I, I really don't know what you mean. Let's just play freeze tag. Nope. I'm not playing the game until you, I'm going to sit right here until you, and Aiden, <laughs> you know, and she, I'm going to sit right here until you tell me, and she sits down, Aiden, well, well, well. And she jumps up. She goes, oh, no, I sat right in it. And she's trying to, like, and I said, don't get that on me. And I start, like, brushing it off me. It was fantastic. So I've, I've, I've taught all my friends how to do this because it's just so fun. You can throw your I told you so's at your neighbor. That is just so Christian. And so, so, you know, we're... We're out at our favorite restaurant. We're blowing off steam after class, you know, and, and so we've got our regular waitress, and she comes up to us, and she's like, guys, I just made the food of the gods. And we're like, that's pretty exciting. Can we have some of it? And she says, well, that's why I'm telling you. I, I, I need people to believe me. I need to show this off. I made mac and cheese. I said, well, I already I love mac and cheese. It's already the food of the gods. She's like, no, you don't understand. Something happened in the kitchen. I can't read. Like, she's being very serious. We're like, what, what just had? She's like, it, it was like magic. It was like chemical perfection in the oven, the perfect heat ratios, cheese sauce. Oh, get to, something happened. It's, the, it's ambrosia. It is the food of the gods. And, and I can't recreate it. I don't know how it happened. I just want people to believe me. You'll only understand if you experience it. It's not even on our menu. We don't, we don't offer it at the restaurant. Just, I made it for the staff. Please let me bring you some. You're my regulars. I just have to show my friends what happened. And we're like, yeah, hook us up. You know, so I'm like, oh, sweet. And my friend Dennis, yeah, bring it out. And then Kevin says, yeah, none for me. And then it's like, Kevin, get some mac and cheese. She's proud of it. Oh, no, no, I'm not hungry. Get some of the girl's mac and cheese. It's the food of the gods. We, I, just, I don't believe that. No, no, really, I'm not hungry. Don't, thanks anyway. She's like, okay, well, I'll bring out for the others. And she goes, and then, you know, Dennis nudges Kevin, come on, wingman services here. I'm starving. It's free food. Get some and give it to me. Oh, I wasn't even thinking of you. Well, yeah, I could tell, you know. And so out she comes, and she brings us the plates of mac and cheese. And I t she wasn't kidding. I, I, I have tried. I think I've hit the double digits now of times I've tried to recreate it. Not even close. The story has tormented my family because we get a lot of people who take cooking seriously. My, my brother is losing his mind. Every time he's like, I think I've done it. I think I've done it. I'm like, no, I'm sorry. It's good to do. And then he takes it personally, and it's like he spent the whole day. It just can't be done. It's, 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 just, it's almost like I wish it never happened, but, but I don't because I got to taste it. You know, it's so amazing. <laughs> like if I could have filet... Or more of that mac and cheese. I'm going more of that mac and cheese. That's pretty serious for me to say that. You know, so we're just raving. We're like, it was an experience. And Dennis is, oh, wow. And, and I'm raving. about. It. Finally, Kevin's like, guys, I got I to gotta see what's going on here. This is, let me, he takes Dennis, you know, Dennis like, okay, try some. Kevin's like, it just, you guys are just talking up such a, whoa. Oh, I had no idea. She was right. I should have got some. Dennis. Like if you ever see the original Karate Kid where Mr. Miyagi, you know, if he slaps his hands together to heal. Like if you've not seen it, don't worry about it. But, you know, we, we don't need that medicine. We need the magic. And so Mr. Miyagi has magic powers to heal the Karate Kid. And so he, Dennis is just smacking his hands. He's like, oh, yeah. He's frothing at the mouth like a foamy dog. He's like, oh, I'll be right back. And he goes to get Kevin's well well. I don't know where Dennis went. I th think he went either the kitchen or maybe even the restroom. I don't know where Kevin's well, well, well was. All I know is that when Dennis was gone to get it, Kevin ate all Dennis's mac and cheese. You know, he's sitting up, <laughs> food of the gods. And then comes Dennis. He's like, well, well, no. 
to come. <laughs> so be careful. Now, fr from that day forward, Dennis makes people go get their own. He makes them good. I'm, I'm driving with him, and I was like, oh, did I, I need to turn up here according to the GPS. He goes, no, no, make this turn. Now I need to follow GPS. I'm telling you, make this turn. He was right. I'm doing a U-turn. He goes, oh, could you get something out of the glove box for me? I said, yeah, sure. I opened the gl glove box. Well, well, well. He said, I'll, I'll never go get somebody's ever again. I make people go get their own. What would, what, this, this is apparently like escalated in the culture at this point. Because I told this story in, in uh, like one of my publications. Well, it, it, it's now out there. I, I was sitting in this, uh, this building where they have a nursing school. I was just doing reading for my studies. And you, know, you just change environments so that, I don't know, I'm tired of reading in this room. I'll go read in that room. I just, I'm so glad I'm done with school. So anyway, I'm sitting in this you know, nursing school building just for a change of environment. There's these nursing students there. And I hear one say to the other, oh, I should have listened to you. I have such a bad headache. I shouldn't have gone out and partied last night. That was so stupid. Oh, you were right. I should have studied with you. You told me I should have listened. And now I'm not ready for the test. And I feel like this. And oh, man, I just. I, I wish I would have listened, and her friend's like, oh, it's going to be good. Well, this perks up my, like, what's going on here? I've never seen these people before. It's going to be icy cold. I'm like, okay, stop. What is happening? And then her friend says, I'll be right back. And she goes over to the Coke machine. She feeds in the dollar, but doesn't take the soft drink just to make something cold come out. This was worth a dollar to her to leave the soft drink there for no other than just something cold came out of something. She puts in the dollar, hits the big Coke button, and in the clunk, 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 and the cold soda comes into the little thing, the tray. She goes, well, well, well. Look who was right about you should have studied last night and not gone and been bad after all. Snap. And I'm like, that's it. Who are you? Where have you heard this? They're like, who are you? Like, with that thing you just did. They said, oh, it's an icy cold well, well, well. I said, don't tell me my own joke. What? They're like, wait, I, you know about this? It's like, you know about this? I said, you got to tell me how you heard about this. Turns out, like, they knew a person who was dating a person who knew a person. This is like four layers removed. They said, yeah, I bought this set of CDs. This guy named Ian Murphy told a story about his niece, Megan, who found a way to throw your I told you so's at your neighbor. They're all excited. Like, shit, yes, Megan, you're in the public. You did it. You had, like, your culture impact. And so I want to keep it spreading. Like, the, and it keeps advancing, you know, the icy cold well. Like, she's brought them to life at this point. I don't know if I can hold it back, Dad. I don't know. It's just so ferocious. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, no. Ah! You know, and then he, like, he actually reflexively guarded his throat. Because he could, see, he could like see the I told you so coming for a throat shot. This language is, it's so easy to get important stuff lost in language. And leave it to a kid to get it back to the basics. You know, the reason I open with that story is you're hearing all that language this week. Those trigger responses, the cause of all unhappiness in the world, sin. Doesn't mean you get it. Doesn't mean you get it. You might, but let's just make sure. And let's let the little children lead us tonight. And let's make sure we've got this concept. Uh, because it's, it's so basic. You know, this is deep enough for saints to drown in its mysterious depth. It's also simple enough for a little kid. It is just, it, it, this is a basic, basic message of love God, love each other. That's what's happy. And kids get it. Think, if I were to give you, I'm not going to give you a test. This is in class. You know, but if I were to hand out a paper and say, define sin. Imagine like if I just put the sin and like, give me a definition of sin. Think, think about you know, what you might write, what you might put down on the paper. Is what you're imaginary writing on your, on your test that doesn't exist something to the effect of the terrific fun God forbids me to have? Or, or are you thinking in terms of rule breaking? You know, I broke the rules. Stuff you're not allowed to do, but it's so super fun and awesome, but figures I'm not allowed. Is, is this the thought process at all, that it's a rule that's broken? Does sin involve rule breaking? Sure it does. 
Sure it does. But that's not fundamentally what makes it sin. What makes sin sin is a broken heart. It's not so much rules that are broken with sin. It's a heart that's broken. Imagine the guy goes up to his wife. Hey, honey, I met this other lady, and she was so much more beautiful than you are. And she was so much more sexy. And it wasn't just her looks. It was her personality. Like, I just wanted to bond with her. I wanted to be her friend. I wanted to communicate. And then I remembered that if I cave into these temptations, I technically break the rules of our contract. So don't worry, I didn't do it. You're about to watch somebody get popped in the nose. And he has it coming. This is what Jesus is getting at. Adultery happens in here. If a heart's already broken, it's not about the technicalities. It's heartbreak that makes it sin. Covenant rupture. If you think of a time in your life that you would define as paradise, I mean, your heaven, like, like what was your happiest memory? Maybe it was a perfect Christmas, perfect date, a uh, perfect road trip to the game. What, whatever it is for you, maybe, maybe for some of you it's memories here. That would be great. But whatever it is for you, your glimpse of heaven, that happiest time, your happy place, the thing that keeps you going when life gets tough, Whatever you're thinking of, I bet you any money what made it happy was the love. I bet what made it happy was you were in a state of right friendship. Kids get it. Think about a little kid. What does a little kid want to do? Go explicate doctrines? No. Um, go make sure that the people they hang out with live up to all their expectations and let them know all the places that they don't? No. Go starving for other people's approval and painting on projected images to feed their sense of significance through people approval. No, all a little child wants to do is go make a friend and play because that's awesome. They get it. That's what's happy is right loving relationship. Your heaven is defined by right state of loving relationship covenant. And I bet if you think about the time in your life that's your personal hell. He said the H word. Yes, I did. I'll say it again. What's your hell? I won't ask you to say it. You know it. Your dark night, that time you never want to go back to. You didn't know it could get that bad. I bet whatever you're thinking of is defined by a state of a broken heart. I bet it's the broken heart that made it hell, whether it's a funeral or get a breakup or, or a failed friendship or a fight with your family or, or a heart-wrenching goodbye, whatever. I bet it's defined by some kind of friendship rupture. That's what sin means is covenant fracture. So we're happy when we have right loving relationship with God and neighbor and sin is the cause of all unhappiness in the world. In other words, heartbreak. It's not so much rules that are broken with sin. It's hearts. And you could, have, you could wax eloquent with all the fancy explications on the Trinitarian dynamic and the, the inner life of the community of being we call Trinity and completely miss the whole point and have a little kid get it better than the scholar who says, it's about friendship, and the kid gets it better. That's what this is all about. All the law and the prophets hang on two things, love God, love each other. Kids get it. Here's some more kid language for these issues. One day, I'm taking my niece, Sorsha, uh, to the ice cream shop. I'm taking her to Baskin Robbins, where they have 31 different flavors. Look at all those options. We live in a culture where the more options you have, the more free you are. That just stresses me out because for any one thing I pick, I just said no to 30 other flavors. And so I'm like regretting that did I pick the wrong thing. So it just it gives me stress. Um, but we're like, we're going to bath. I said, what are you going to pick? What flavor are you going to pick, Sorsha? She says, chocolate chip mint monkey, cookie dough monkey, fight. Now, 
I'm beyond impressed as I was. Now, all you see is like, like an android with the eyes darting back and forth, processing, processing, processing. But I can picture the legendary battle between two monkeys. We've got fleshly appetite in the mood for chocolate chip mint ice cream. And he is armed to the teeth, ready for war, facing off against a glorious cookie dough warrior. And the two of them are going at it like Hector and Achilles. It's the stuff of legend. This battle between these two monkeys is epic. But here's all you see. And then all of a sudden, a calm peace washes over my niece. Chocolate chip mint monkey wins. I'm going to get chocolate chip mint. The kid, this is genius. Do you realize what you just did? Like my nieces teach me all my best language. This is amazing. She just gave kid language for what St. Paul calls in the New Testament the war between the flesh and the spirit. But a kid can get it, and she's processing it. right? She, she's got different fleshly appetites, and they're at war with each other. We have these. We have these. This gives us a way to talk about our lives. You know, if you ever get the C on the test of the paper, and the person sitting next to you is your friend, and they get the A, are you happy for your friend? Well, that's a, that's a tough question, isn't it now? Because you in your entirety might be happy for your friend. In other words, we're complex, right? We're made in the image and likeness of Trinity. We have thoughts of the head, feelings of the heart, Appetites of the flesh, relational intimacies, hopes and dreams, the story of our lives, our growth, our challenges, our victories, our failures, our successes, our brokenness, our healing. We're, we're, we're dynamic. There's a lot to us. There's a lot going on in us. So maybe you in your whole selfhood, the entirety of your soul, yes, you're happy for your friend because they got the A. But your monkey hates them. Because monkey hate lose. You know, and, and, and trying to tell a monkey about the, the virtue of humility is like trying to teach cabbage calculus. It doesn't understand. That's not going to comfort the monkey. I would be humbled if I won. No, monkey. Yeah. It's the monkeys don't get it. They just, monkey's mad. Meanwhile, or have you ever been the one to get the A? Person sitting next to you gets the C. Now, do you feel bad for your friend? Sure, you do, the, all of you, the, the fullness of you, but your monkey loves it because monkey love win. And monkey love win even more when everyone else lose because then win count more. You know, picture this scenario. The, uh, the girlfriend goes up to the boyfriend, right? Oh, I just met this great new friend. Now, the boyfriend's playing it cool, but here's his monkeys. She said, great new friend. It could be a male. Is that com competition? I'm threatened. I feel threatened. It's a, competing, it's a competing male. But if I let on that I feel threatened, that's not masculine. That'll turn her off. That'll turn her on more to the competition. I have to appear confident and masculine, but I feel so threatened. I hope it's not a dude. Please don't be a dude. I'm waiting to hear if it's a dude. Oh, so this great new friend, the only reason I did good on that test was because he stayed up she said, he, it's a dude. <laughs> oh, he was amazing. He's so smart. And so we had to pull an all-nighter studying for the... They stayed up all night. Oh, and you've got to hear his accent. He's charming. I am threatened. <laughs> Official competition. She likes him. She's telling me so that she doesn't have to feel like a bad person because she's in love with him. And she thinks if she tells me about it, that exonerates her guilt. <laughs> He's from Spain. He's an exchange student. His name's D'Artagnan. <laughs> well, since we had to pull an all-nighter, I mean, he got me and my roommates. We all got A's, thank to him. He's so brilliant. So he had to get ready at our place, but all we had was strawberry shampoo, so his hair smelled like strawberries all day. 
she's sniffing his hair. So we teased him. We called him Strawberry. Girls tease when they like. I can't wait for you to meet him. You would love him. That means she associates him with the person she's dating. She's associating him with dating. I can't wait for you to meet my new friend. Now, at this point, you, in your entirety, might like D'Artagnan just fine. Your monkey wants to kill D'Artagnan. <laughs> you just got a fresh new kill D'Artagnan monkey in that moment. I have an entire monkey dedicated to being annoyed by Ryan Seacrest. I don't know why. You have no reason to dislike this man. There's just something about him. He just bothers me. It's not fair to him. I should pray for him. I don't understand. If somebody told me, hey, you're fine. My monkeys just can't stand you. I'd be pretty hurt by that. It's not fair, but it's just there. I'm annoyed by Keanu Reeves. I don't understand why he can't act. <laughs> I, even when he wakes up in the real world, in the Matrix, he still can't act. <laughs> Here's a million dollars to go. I, guess, I must be nice. <laughs> I'm just saying. You know, we're not disinterested parties and who gets the goods. And this guy gets millions of dollars for making faces. You know, th that's awful. That's, a, that's not Christian. That's not good. That's my monkeys. I understand this. I got to deal with this. We all have got them. We're, we all deal with these appetites of the flesh. Now, for the record, in and of themselves, your fleshly appetites are not evil. I don't want you to think that, like, that if it's of the flesh, it's evil, and if it's of the spirit, it's good, and so were these good souls trapped in wicked shells longing for escape. That's actually a heresy that's not a, Catholicism is creation affirming. In the incarnation, God affirmed the created order. He became part of it. And he did something spectacular. He reversed the defilement model. The defilement model goes like this. If I have dirt and I have clean water and they come into contact, what do I get? Mud. I get dirty water and I can't drink it anymore. In other words, the dirty thing renders the clean thing dirty. If I have clean hands and I touch the ground, I have to go wash my hands again because the dirty rendered the clean dirty again. That's called defilement. When God entered the fallen world, the fallen world did not taint God. God redeemed the fallen world. He brought the kingdom of heaven on the earth. His kingdom now comes on earth as it is in heaven. We get to taste it now. We get to be citizens of it presently. He has brought the healing process. Healing is now available. His spirit now dwells directly with you. The Holy Spirit lives within you. The, the tainted creation did not defile God. God reverses the defilement model. The clean thing renders the dirty thing clean again. This is like a new, this is incredible. His presence in your life, the clean, renders the dirty clean again. You are forgiven. It is cast as far as the east is from the west. You confess your, your sins. He, it's like he throws them into a sea of forgetfulness. He puts up a sign, says, no fishing. It's gone. It doesn't say as far as the north is from the south. That's far, but that's a fixed distance. The Bible says as far as the east is from the west, your sins have been removed. The east goes on forever east. It's an infinity. The west goes on forever west. It's this poetic way to say it's like two eternities separate your sins from God. They are gone. They're wiped out. The clean thing has rendered the dirty thing clean. So th this is good news indeed. Catholicism is creation affirming. God created it. He called it good. And he created you and he called you his masterpiece. And therein lays your worth. 
not from people approval, from you were fearfully and wonderfully knit together, and he loves your brokenness. This is creation affirming. In other words, sleep is okay. It's good to eat. If you don't eat, you starve, and then you die, and this is bad. You know, the, so the problem isn't with fleshly appetites. No, there are times for dancing and feasting. Catholicism is life-affirming. It's, it's, it's a celebration. It's about happiness. It's about right relationship and then just happy again. God wants you to be happy, reasonably happy with him now in this life, perfectly happy with him forever in the next. Beatific vision. In other words, you get to meet him face to face. It's like you're not in the womb anymore. You're now... Oh, that whole time was so, I was so darkened, and I was so upside down, and now you get to see your maker face to face. So reasonably happy now, perfectly happy with him forever in the next life. He created it. It was good. He created you. You're his masterpiece, and there is feasting and dancing and celebration and life to the full, life abundant, the fruits of peace and joy. A peace so powerful that you can even have it amidst earthly wars because it's not defined by an absence of war. It's defined by something bigger than the problem, God himself. And you have it even amidst the trouble. So the creation's good. So to get this, the monkeys aren't something to think of as bad. The problem is they can get out of control. That's the problem. Eating's good. Blowing up to almost 300 pounds where I could have died of, of, of a heart attack in my 20s, that was dumb. That's bad. You know, sleeping, good. Sleeping all the time, this is problematic. You know, it's it's kind of common sense. So it's not that the fleshly appetites, your monkeys, are all bad. It's that you've got to keep them in check because there's the propensity to the idol. And if you do whatever the monkeys tell you to do, you're not free. And if you're doing whatever something tells you to do, by definition, you're not free. So they need to be kept in check. That's what the monkeys are about. You know, God gave us a great grace. When he created us, he removed the purring motor that he put in cats. He, he like, that tells you the cat's happy, kitty's happy. <sighs> he took that out of humans to protect us. This is a great mercy. We would be so caught, our monkeys would give us away every time. Oh, what'd you get on that paper? Oh, I got a C. What'd you get? I got an A. <sighs> Why'd you start purring? Oh, no, I feel so bad about that C. You should have got an A on this. That's not fair. <sighs> you love it because monkey love win. A monkey love win even more when everyone else lose because win count more. I know. Honey, I'm so, I'm so sorry. I, I got to leave you alone tonight. I just have to, I, I know you're going to miss me. Oh, I sure am going to miss you. You go do what you need to do, but I'm going to miss you so bad. <sighs> Why'd you start purring as soon as you found out I had to leave? Oh, no, baby. I'm just, I'm just thinking about how much you mean to me and how, how good it's going to feel when you come back. <sighs> you weren't purring when I was here. You didn't start purring until you heard I was going. No, no, baby. You don't understand. That's not true. It's because you want the house to yourself, because I'm getting on your nerves, and you want to get rid of me. And as soon as you're alone, you're going to chew some tobacco. <laughs> oh, baby, no. That's disgusting habit. I'd never do that. <sighs> so why don't you just go talk to D'Artagnan if he's so awesome? <sighs> We'd be dead meat. So God, in his mercy removed the purring motor from the people. You know, I got to see Sorsha's first crisis of conscience, you know, before she gave me the, the gift of the monkeys to describe the war between the flesh and the spirit. When she was a, a baby, she had this bad habit of stealing lipstick and writing on walls and rugs. And, and because it's like, I, I can identify with this because it's the perfect crayon. Like, from a child's perspective, like, they play with Crayola, right? You know, but it, Crayola red, it's waxy. 
You know, you try to color with Crayola. It's not even. It's, it's like lumps of wax. And you try to make the color even, so you keep coloring, and it's still not even. Some parts are clumpier and redder, and other parts are more empty because you're smearing wax. It's just, it doesn't. Then you've got this thing mommy has in her purse, this super crayon. It's amazing. You've got a brilliant, unbroken stream of consistent bright color. It just smears on, it glides on with ease, and you don't even have to color it. It's the perfect crayon. It's, 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 it's the grown-up crayon. She called it Minch. She didn't call it lipstick. I don't know why. It's just a baby word. But I guess like the mommy mouth, like Minch, like putting it on. So maybe that's where it comes from. It's, I think it looks more like it should be called Minch than lipstick. It just, it's a better word for it. It just look. I prefer Minch. It's now Minch now to me because it's just she f has a better word for it than Webster's. So, she she but she'd steal the Minch and write on things. Well, my mom, her grandmother, has this priceless heirloom carpet, hand woven, handed down the Demarest family line. It's it's like the only sur surviving relic from the family that founded Bergen County, New Jersey. We didn't see any of the wealth. Somehow they blew all that, but we get a rug. Fine. But the sentimental value, to my mother, it's priceless. You know, So uh, she's getting nervous because it's, the, it's like perfectly canvas shaped, and, and she knows it's in danger. So she's like, okay, Sorsha, we need to talk. Yes, Grandmommy? Okay, I, you know how you've been writing on things with the minch? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, well, you know that's bad, right? <laughs> Yes. Uh, okay. Um, it, whatever you do, uh, you know you can't do that. I know, Grandma. Okay, just don't ever take my lipstick from my purse and write on this rug. This is Grandmommy's special rug. This would that would really hurt my feelings if you if you minched this. So just don't. Sorsha's eyes are lighting up. Okay. Now, like, what was, Mom, she had this coming. I'm sorry, that was just dumb. I get, if people before the fall, we're talking prelapsarian humanity, prelapse, pre fall, pre concupiscence, pre disordered tendencies, pre original sin, it's still paradise. There's still right relationship with God and neighbor, and it's awesome, right? And even in the, that heavenly paradise, people still couldn't handle whatever you do, don't eat the fruit from this tree that's right here. How much worse now with disorder? For crying out loud, mom told her where the lipstick was. What in the world was she thinking? She had this coming. I walk in on the scene. There's the spilt out grandmommy purse. There's my little niece sitting cross-legged on the rug with the most triumphant, brilliantly red Pac-Man I've ever seen. <laughs> and my in walks my mom. No. Well, she's in timeout. And I got I have I have this monkey that gets the looksy lose. He gets the case of the looksy lose. I want to go sneak creep a peek on my little niece in timeout just see how she was processing this. I just couldn't resist. So I I confess I spied on her in timeout. There she is sitting in timeout. And the poor little kid wrestling with her conscience. Again, kids get it. And she's sitting there, she says, Grandmommy said, no minch. No minch on rug. It would hurt Grandmommy's feelings. I broke Grandmommy's heart. Why did I do it? I wanted to do it. <laughs> I thought it would be fun. It's not fun now. And then she starts crying, the sweet little thing. The little kid wrestling with her conscience. And all she wanted was reconciliation. Reconcile the friendship. Reconcile the fractured covenant. Get paradise back. Get closer to heaven. Get the happiness back, which comes from mending the rupture in the heart bond. It's a, love is at the core of everything. Kids just get this. They just naturally get it. 
You know, I, one of my monkeys, I'll get vulnerable with you now and tell you about it. I lack patience. I, my, I have anxious monkey. Anxious monkey want now. Anxious monkey want answer now. I have a hard time waiting. I don't like to wait. Like at the amusement park. Oh, just think in one hour we'll get to ride the roller coaster for one minute. I, I don't know. I like, but like, love roller coaster monkey has has a very short battle, with hate waiting monkey and hate waiting monkey just boof. <laughs> and go sit on the merry-go-round sooner than wait an hour for one minute's ride. I just hate to wait, you know. It, like going to the ER, that's the worst experience. So this is this by has got to be penitential for me. Buy me time out of purgatory. This is like Ian torture. You know, first of all, you go up to you have to get in the car and you're waiting in traffic to get to the ER. Then you get to the ER and you're waiting for the nurse to call you up for the paperwork. Then they call you up for the paperwork. Psych, they called my name, great things are no, it's just fill this out, give it back when you're done. Then you fill it out, you give it back, okay, go sit and wait. And so now I'm waiting again. And then finally they call you up. Oh, good, they call you up. Nope, it's just to make you stand on that scale that adds 10 pounds. And then that thing that squeezes your arm that will make you, it will hurt you if you're not already damaged at the ER, this thing could take care of it. And then they tell you, you know, you know that this is your blood pressure. You're like, look, I'm, I just, I have strep throat. Well, we'll get to that. We just have to go through all our rules. Do you have insurance? Yes. Okay, then we can love you, you know? And so then, they, then, then you have to go wait again. And then finally the, they call you in, and oh, all right, it's finally time. And then you go in, but another psych, now you're, you, now you're waiting in a doctor's room, and the doctor comes in, okay, finally. And he says, okay, here's what I need you to do, I'll be back in a moment. Now you're left waiting again in your underwear, sitting on a piece of wax paper. <laughs> finally he comes back. And it's like, is this over? Is this, is this, a, and he tell you, and he's like, okay, so what's the problem? I have strep throat. Let me take a look at that. You have strep throat. That'll be $50 copay. How's that work? I waited for that. I told him there's an echo in here, and he gets $50 for the echo. Okay, now wait, because you're going you're gonna, to, and then he gives like, what's your pain on a scale of 1 to 10? I hate that question. Be, because if I tell him like, like 3 or 4, He's going to be like, oh, then you don't need anything. And I have strep throat, and it hurts. But if I tell him, like, 10, he's going to be like, you don't have a third-degree burn for crying out loud. And so he's probably aware of pain scale inflation, like grade inflation. So he's probably going to automatically subtract 2 from whatever number I give him. So I'm computing that. If I give him 8, he'll think 6. But if I give him 9, he'll think I'm a liar and reduce to 1. So he'll be like, um... Um, it's really bad strep throat. I'm at a five. So that's like a three. You're fine. No, I'm not. It hurts. You know, and so then, like, and then he's like, well, this is a really bad infection, so we got to give you a shot in your side. But he has a completely different definition of my side than I do. At the side, like, never mind. So... <laughs> so now I'm waiting for a needle... And then, then finally, finally I get my script, and then I have to go to the pharmacy, and then it'll be 30 minutes you have to wait. It's it just this, and I, I, can't, I can't stand it, let alone waiting on God. If anyone here is waiting on God for something, boy, that's just no fun. So I'm with you. This is just one example of my monkeys. Whatever monkeys cause you strife. Whatever fleshly appetites get in the way of your growth and holiness. Okay, we already know there's confession. We already know the grace is always bigger than the sin. But again, the language, do we know what it means? Do we know how this looks? I want to give you something tonight that you can take with you from our great doctor of the church, Thomas Aquinas, that again, it is simple, it's simple enough for a little kid. Now, I cannot use any of Aquinas' actual vocabulary, but the concept is simple enough for a child. This is the how of grace working in your life. This is the how of taking your friendship with Jesus further. 
This is the how of getting out of the things that make you unhappy and increasing in your peace, your joy, and your happiness. This is how it plays out, and it works like this. Our actions, the things we do, form habits. Those habits define our character. Actions form habits define character. Suppose I define somebody as an excellent piano player. What a beautiful piano player. Notice I've, de I've referred to their character. They are an excellent piano player. It's like something definitive of them. They are this. Now, how did they get that character? Well, they were in the habit of playing excellent piano. And how did they get in the habit of playing excellent piano? By individual acts of practicing. There's something about doing something 40 times. It's like this magic number. If you do the same thing 40 times, it's no longer an individual action. It's become a habit. What, what I mean by habit, and this is very powerful, this can be very life-changing, transforming and freeing for somebody, and happy, good news indeed. Habit means you have the tendency to behave that way. You're inclined to do that thing. It's habitual. You don't feel complete if you don't. You kind of itch to do it. It's part of your day. The day's not complete if you don't do this thing. It's a habit. You're used to it. And then eventually, it's who you are. This means that we're responsible for who we are. So, you know, somebody says, well, pff, I just don't like praying. Yes, but you formed that habit. I'm just not into this stuff. Yes, but your actions became habit, which ended up, now you associate yourself with that. There is no such thing as just one tiny little choice. The person who has the addiction, it didn't happen overnight. It started with a singular action. You know, they didn't wake up, I want to go do this self-destructive thing. I've never heard a five-year-old say, I just need some Vicodin. You know, I, I, I've, I've never seen, like, a little kid, you know, talk about, like, oh, we have a computer? I think I'll get hooked on eight hours of night of horrible Internet sites. You know, no, no child, nobody just overnight just goes, it starts with an action, and you do it 40 times, and now it's habitual. Now there's, it's part of your day. It fe you feel a tendency. You feel inclined. It feels normal. And then you associate that as who you are. Well, why, why don't you, you know, do more for the church? That's just not me. That's just not who I am. Yes, but you shaped who you are. I don't want to stop this thing. I just, I want to drink to excess. I, I want this problem. You think you do. You shaped it. Now, and I don't mean this as convicting news. I mean this is very good news. You can change. You don't have to stay broken. If there's something you want to beat, here's how it plays out. This is how the grace looks in its operation. You do something different 40 times, and then, bam, something's happened. It's habitual. You keep that habit up 40 more times, and suddenly you're a different person. You don't have to stay broken. If there's something you want out of your life, you can get it out of your life. Now, for the record, for the record, if anyone's thinking they can do this on their own steam, get that thought out of your head. Aquinas makes very clear this is grace-dependent. You've got to pray in the grace. You cannot do this on your own power. God would never expect you to carry that burden. His yoke is easy. His burden's light. He takes your bro brokenness and he carries you. That's, he, this is not a burdensome thing. God wants to be a part of it, and he has to be. If he's not, it won't work. You'll just, you will fall. And even with his help, 
you're still going to fall. That's what confession's for. Just get back up and keep going. Because, okay, suppose you, like, do the good thing, you do the good thing, you do the good thing, and then you fall. Get right back up. He'll forgive you. As far as the east is from the west, no fishing. Just get back up because you're 36 more away from happiness. When I weighed close to 300 pounds, I decided I don't want to look like this, right? So what do I do? Well, I've got to go to the gym. My sleep monkey and my hungry monkey formed their first ever coalition. It's gr amazing how enemies can unite over a common foe. I don't want him going to the gym. I want him to sleep in. I don't want him going to the gym. I want him to eat more food and pig out. Why are you going to the gym? And so they team up on me, and I'm fighting two monkeys here that I've developed through my own habit formation. Again, I just want to pig out. I don't want to go to the gym. But I shaped that. I was responsible for that, and I wanted to be different. And so, But I, I could do that by God's grace, and here's how it happened. Drag myself to the gym. Oh, is it always going to be this rough? My sleep monkey hates me. Sleep monkey's so sad. Hungry monkey hate, hate me right now. You want to pig out? He hates this. Is it always going to be this hard and grueling? No, it's not. It's just going to be that grueling 39 more times. Because then I get up and I go drag myself to the gym a second time. 38 away. I've And always just praying in the grace. God, I can't do it. I can't do it. But the grace was there, and, and I was just, there was sufficient grace in the present moment, just enough, that, it, that that day was enough trouble of its own, and I could do it. And 40 times later, I was in the habit of going to the gym. It's like a switch was thrown. I was inclined to. I tended to. I wanted to. 40 more times, it was just part of who I was. I was a healthier person. I'm down over 70 pounds. I still got more to go. But how does that happen? Well, by God's grace, but that is how it looked. This isn't just powerful, life-changing stuff for beating a vice. I, there's even better news than that. This is incredible for being happy. This, this, is, this is how you can be happy. You know, one day I thought, like, you know, I, I teach these people all this stuff. Am I doing it? Am I actually doing the things I preach, or am I just another hypocrite? You know, I thought, like, okay, so I should go be more loving. I thought, what's something I can do? And I just basically picked at random a virtue. Okay, mercy. Mercy is a good virtue. The, I, my favorite definition of mercy comes from Father Jim Keenan entering into the chaos of another. That's what God did for us. He entered the mess, entered into the chaos. You know, there's more synapses in the human brain than there are stars in the galaxy. So when you enter into another person's life, it's like you're entering into a whole galaxy. And you don't know what that person's hiding on the dark side of Neptune. So suit up, go in and love somebody and meet some needs and be there and care. You know, so I did this and I said, I'm going to go help out this Chinese family. Because they got this son and this daughter that they got to do dishes, they got to take phone calls, they got to translate for the family business. They're like kids. They get home from school and they work all evening. That's tough. I want to go help. So I go and I introduce myself to the parents. I say, look, I'm a teacher. I'd like to tutor your kids and refuse payment. I, I just I want to do something merci merciful. Now, okay, what's the fancy like, corporal works of mercy? Beautiful language. It just meant caring going out and showing a kid that they mattered, right? And they said, oh, we're, we're not too proud. We're humble. We need the help. Thank you, sir. Yes, please. So once a week, I go and tutor these two kiddos. Forty times later, it was just a habit. Almost a year of going every week, and just I'd do my homework with these kids. I'd help them with their homework. Then I'd play Connect Four and draw pictures. And then 40 more times, like another year goes by, it's just part of who I am. I'm part of their family. I'll never forget the dinner when they, they like made it official. You are now part of our family. And so they bring in this bowl with octopus tentacles. 
coming out of the side of the bowl. They locked the restaurant door, time for real authentic Chinese food. I'm like, no, please. I'm like, oh, yes, and it's like an honor. It would insult. I always knew that missionary work would have me eating disgusting food someday. This was inevitable. And so I'm like praying for the grace. Then they bring in the fish, and it still has its face. And then they're, they're trying to explain to me that the face is the best part. Like, the face? You don't, I don't eat face. That just sounds bad. You know, I don't eat octopus tentacles. That's, it's not as bad as an olive, but... But no, I, I grinned and I bared it and I smiled and they were honored. And I was like, now it's like a part of my character. I'm part of the family, right? And all this amazing, it would, I didn't need a PhD to do this. I just reached out. I showed somebody I cared. You can do this. And it was so happy when a little kid looks up to me. I, I get to be a kid one day a week. Thank you so much. And as I feel my heart just getting bigger. Bigger, bigger, explodes like, oh, wow, this is amazing. You mean this love stuff really is this happy? This is awesome. She says to me one day, she says, you know what? I've met the gods of China, and I'm not impressed. I'm impressed with your God. I want to know him. I want to know Jesus. One day I had to move because of work, so I couldn't go visit them anymore. But one day, and I hadn't seen them in almost a year just because of, of the move. And one day out of the blue, I'm praying, and I get this like intrusional thought. It doesn't happen all the time. It's like the spirit nudge. It's like the wind. You can't see it, but you experience its movement. And I get this tug nudge. Go drive 80-mile round trip and visit that family. Like, either I'm crazy or this is the truth. I'm going with it. I'm going with it. I get in my car, and I drive out, and I walk into this restaurant. I had never been hugged before by any of one in this family. They don't hug. They don't do that. They're, they're very rigid and proper. And so to have this kid come running up and throw her arms around my neck, squeezing me, was quite the surprise. And she's crying. I'm like, kid, it's okay. What's, are you okay? And she's just squeezing and squeezing. She goes, you don't understand. You don't understand. I tried Jesus today. I prayed. I tried prayer. I said, Jesus, can you draw my friend Ian here today? And here you are. He's real. And he heard me. He sees me. I didn't have to do any. All I had to do was care. God did everything else. This is where your happiness comes from. You can do this. Pick a kid. I promise you're famous to that kid. You're famous to that kid. They come around, look, I drew you. And it's this ugly stick figure. looks nothing like you. And you're like, that is a fine specimen. I'm hanging that on my fridge right there. It's a champion. And the kid's like, yes. And there's your little mustard seed that turns into the largest of garden plants. That kid becomes an artist someday or is so boosted and encouraged. This is what we're supposed to be out there doing. The Catholic Church has the numbers to do this. Only we do this. Like, we have a billion. Imagine if they knew a billion people were Christians by their love. Think of what this could accomplish. As you've already been told, you're not the church of the future. You're the church right now. This is what you're supposed to be out there doing. Go love some. Oh, but they're gay. Love them. Oh, but they're Hindu. Love them. The job, just be Jesus to them. Just meet their needs. Enter their chaos. Show them they matter. Find God's image and likeness in that baby. Speak it to the surface. Watch how happy you get. Watch the stuff God does as you simply build new loving habits. And it's so happy. You can do this too. This is our high calling of greatness to go love, to go wash feet. Jesus is aware of the culture of death, and he is not happy about it. But here's the way things work right now. The weeds and the crops grow side by side. He will return and sort that out. He promised to. He doesn't break promises. In the meantime, in the meantime, we still have the chance to go rescue some more of his kidnapped babies. So go do it. Pick a virtue and just start, maybe just email People from here, when you leave this place twice a week, just a quick little, what's going on with you? Here's what's going on with me, just checking in. Miss you. 
And then like, okay, 40 emails later, it's just a habit. You're just inclined. I haven't done Thursday's emails yet. I send them. Just, and, and then watch as people start writing you back with, oh, I needed that so much. God spoke to me through you. That was so perfectly timed. I needed that thing. And you're like, wow, my heart's getting so big. It's so awesome. It's happy. And then all of a sudden, it's just who you are. You're just an encourager. And it's such a happier way to live. Pick a virtue, start acting in it, and that is, watch what can happen in your life. It, it's amazing. Go out, be his hands and feet, and thank you for your attention. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. God bless you all. You are amazing, every one of you.